Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things that are important to me and I think deserve to be important to you as well. Uh, as always, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever, to the show, you can email me directly. My email address is whoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up here, around here, somewhere, a couple of times during the show. And you can do a search on that, go there, and get the uh, email address directly from there. Now, I also want to mention that uh, I discovered that uh, due to a mix-up, some of you people in Plymouth haven't seen the last few weeks' shows. Uh, but now, yeah, you're going to be getting one, a new show every week now, I promise. I'm going to do it myself to make sure that there's, so if there's a problem, it's all my own fault. Um, but uh, I wanted to start, there's several things I want to get to this week, and I'm not going to be able to do all of them in the depth that I would have wanted. But... Uh, I'll try my best. The first thing is that there are some things, some stories where it's the little thing about it that gets me. It's, it's the little thing sometimes that annoys me. And this is a good example of that. Uh, you may have heard about the case of, uh, her name is Emma Sullivan. She's a 17-year-old high school senior out in Kansas. And she had been taking part in a youth and government program in Topeka. And uh, she was there with a group of her friends and other students. And during a speech by Governor Sam Brownback, she apparently tweeted to her friend, she was in the back of the group, and tweeted to her friends that just made mean comments at Governor Brownback and told him he sucked in person. Uh, hashtag, he blows a lot. Well, now, obviously, she didn't actually say it to his face. She was in the back of the group, but she was tweeting, joking with some friends. Well, it turns out that Brownback's staff scours all media, including Facebook and Twitter, for any mentions of the governor. They came across this. They contacted the Youth and Government Program, which contacted the school, with a message from the governor saying, in effect, uh, we think you should know what your students are doing. So the principal calls, uh, calls Emma Sullivan into his office. He balls her out. He tells her she has to write a letter of apology to Brownback, to the Youth and Government Program, and to the school, and that it's supposed to be in by Monday, young lady. And according to her, he also gave her, in fact, gave her talking points. In fact, he told her what to say in the letter. Well, word of this got out, and other than some superannuated fuss budgets crying in their beer about these kids today, the reaction was overwhelmingly negative. In fact, Brownback got hundreds of negative responses on his uh, website, on his Facebook page, rather. And the school got what the principal rather hyperbolically called hate mail. Uh, and meanwhile, Emma Sullivan, to her credit, decided she was not going to write a letter of apology. She said she had done nothing wrong, and so any apology would be insincere. Well, the upshot of this, when Monday comes, Emma Sullivan didn't apologize. Sam Brownback did. His office issued a statement apologizing for this overreaction. He blamed it on his staff, but he called it an overreaction, and he did apologize. The school, for its part, said, eh, forget about the letter, and in fact implied there never would have been any punishment if she'd never written it in the first place. Which, yeah, I thought, right, yeah. Your principal calls you into his office, bowls you out, demands you write a letter of apology, tells you what to say in it, and then you're supposed to think that there'd be no consequences if you just ignored him. Yeah, I believe that. But that wasn't the little thing that got me about this. That wasn't the little thing. The little thing that got me about this was that, well, in effect, Brownback apologized. The school backed down and, in essence, apologized. No one told her the school didn't tell her about not writing the letter. Brownback's office never contacted her. She found out about this when members of the news media contacted her to ask her for her reaction. So even after apologizing and backing down, they still had to diss her. That's the little thing. By the way, it turns out subsequently to this that uh, she's reporting getting uh, bullied, uh, cyberbullying on, on, uh, at school. Um, she's been repeatedly called a whore uh, on Twitter accounts. Two, as it turns out, at Politico, the applause of the mouth-breathing troglodytes 
in the comments section. Well, that's a, I suppose that's in some ways a relatively minor outrage. Here's a bigger one. You might call it my outrage of the week, which is, I can't guarantee I'll have an outrage of the week every week, but this is, we'll do for this week. There are these things called cluster bombs. They're a kind of munition. They're bombs that when you drop them, they open up and they scatter out a large number of what are called bomblets over a wide area. The problem with these is that they can sit there for days, weeks, even months until somebody, all too often a civilian, all too many, uh, in, in too many of those cases a child, disturbs one of these bomblets. It goes off, taking a foot, a hand, or sometimes a life with it. Cluster bombs have been banned under a 2008 UN convention that's now been signed by more than 100 countries. Well, in negotiations that took place in Geneva this month, November, the U.S., which has refused to sign this convention and, in fact, has used cluster bombs in Iraq and uses them now in Afghanistan, the United States tried to get a protocol attached to this U.N. convention. The protocol would effectively lift the ban on any cluster bombs made since 1980, any time in the last 31 years. It was joined in this effort by other nations that make cluster bombs, uh, Russia, China, uh, Israel, uh, India, and Pakistan. The good news here is that this effort failed. Uh, it was opposed by a coalition of countries, including France, Germany, Italy, Portugal, the UK, and Australia, and uh, a large number of other smaller nations. So here, the US continues to use these weapons continues to use a weapon of war banned by international convention because here, as in so many other cases, we decided that international law is for other people. All right, the next thing I want to talk about, and this is going to be the longest segment here, but it's something that's immediate and uh, needs to be dealt with today. If you use the Internet, and I imagine a lot of you out there do, you should be concerned about this. The first thing you need to realize in, in considering this is that the entertainment industry uh, has always looked upon the internet as just another means to uh, promote, distribute, and sell their, their wares to passive consumers, which means the rest of us. Uh, that an industry has never liked independently produced content. It has never liked the fact that people put stuff up there for free. It thinks rather that the internet should basically be a computerized combination TV, movie theater, uh, stereo system. Where with, with Hollywood, if I can use the cliche description, with Hollywood providing the content and the rest of us ponying up the bucks, either directly or through advertising, to see or hear it. Now, obviously, large parts of the internet are beyond that reach. Um, and the, the industry can't do anything about them other than, other than complaining about inferior quality, which, in fairness, is often a valid, if rather insincere, complaint. But what's happened is that, the, um, to the industry's horror, it has discovered that there are a lot of people who do not need multi-million dollar production values in order to enjoy a, a video or a song. Uh, in fact, often enough, the very fact that this material was independently produced is in and of itself enough to make it acceptable. So the industry sucked with that part, which is probably why they are focusing so much more on the part they can do something about, copyright infringement. Now, I have to start here with a full disclosure. I do have some sympathy for the industry's position on this. I worked as a professional photographer for several years. I have edited and published a political newsletter, and I have seen both my photography and my writing used without permission, compensation, or even attribution, which is actually all I would have asked for. So I do support the idea of copyright protection. But as I've said before, power always wants more power, and that's is as true economically as it is politically. Industry's latest effort on this front uh, are bills recently introduced in Congress. In the Senate, it's called the Protect IP Act, or PIPA, P-I-P-A. 
In the House, there's an even worse version called Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA. These bills supposedly are aimed at attacking what the industry calls, with typical hyperbolic inflation, an epidemic, a tidal wave of um, copyrighted material illegally distributed on the web. Now, the thing is, there are all, already federal laws that can be used to launch a legal attack, by which I mean one through the courts, to launch a legal attack on sites that infringe on copyright. But for the industry, those means are too slow, they're too cumbersome, they're too much of a hassle. The industry wants it to be made easy for them. And uh, that's what these bills would do. Now, they're complex, but in a nutshell, this is what goes on. Um, corporations would go to the Justice Department and say, such and such a site has material infringing on our copyright. At that point, the Attorney General would be empowered to block access to that site, up to and including the full domain. And now note, this is before, not as the result of any law enforcement investigation or court action. Before. With a court order, uh, search engines could be required to eliminate these sites from any search results that they produce. Online payment plans like PayPal could be ordered to not do any business with the site, and places that place online ads could be ordered to not do any businesses with those sites. But what's pr probably the most dangerous thing about these bills, most dangerous aspect of these, the House bill, the House bill this is, it revokes the so-called safe harbor provisions of the DMCA, that's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. That was the last, um, the previous Hollywood-inspired copyright brouhaha. Under safe harbor provisions, a website is not civilly or criminally liable for copyright infringing material on that site, provided it takes good faith efforts to remove that material once it's pointed out to them by the copyright holder. Uh, SOPA, the House version of this bill, removes that protection, which means websites could be sued, in essence, for not doing enough to proactively protect the interest of Hollywood. All social media, all user-generated content, all sites that use it, um, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, um, Tumblr, SoundCloud, YouTube, political sites that have user content, like, um, oh, on the left, there's, there's Fire Dog Lake, there's Crooks and Liars, there's Daily Kos. On the right, there's places like Free Republic. Um, all of these sites would be held, could be held legally responsible for everything on that site. Every post, every video clip, every sound clip that is submitted by any user to that site. In fact, it appears they could be held responsible for any links to uh, infringing material. Which also means, hypothetically, any site anywhere in the internet that allows comments could be held legally liable for any link in a comment to infringing material. At the same time, these bills, both of them, give legal immunity to the corporations, that, uh, to the, to the uh, media corporations that demand your material be removed, and the technical company that actually does it, for accidentally or mistakenly removing material. In other words, uh, they strip your site. They block access to your site. They strip material off your site. And you're later able to prove that the material wasn't copyrighted, or you had the rights to it, or you weren't the site they actually were going after. You have no recourse against them. They just go, oops. And any damage you suffered as the result of their actions is your problem. And it does all this. These bills do all this stuff without stopping internet uh, copying uh, without, without stopping the piracy, without stopping the copyright infringement. Because the offending sites, and by these I mean uh, the sites that these bills are supposedly actually aimed at, the ones that actually are devoted to what amounts to intellectual piracy, 
um, they will be able to carry on because under these bills, yeah, the domain name is blocked, but there's no way to block the numeric address, that is the actual IP address of a website. That's still available. So it doesn't even stop the piracy. And I got to tell you, if you can listen to that and you can understand what an enormous impact, what an enormous threat that is to the Internet, what an enormous threat it is to free speech online, to creativity, what a threat it is to spoofs, to satires, to critical coverage of the media or, or its products, then frankly, you aren't thinking this through or frankly at all. These bills create an organized system for internet censorship. And even if that's not the intention, that is the undeniable impact. These bills must be stopped. Now, fortunately, one senator, Ron Wyden of Oregon, put a hold on the bill in the Senate, which has enabled opposition to have time to build up. I mean, the tech industry is against it, I think, for obvious reasons. Um, so are a lot of online outfits. Again, I think rather obviously, places like Facebook, eBay, LinkedIn, AOL, they're all against it. Um, the um, executive chair of Google, a guy named Eric Schmidt, called the House bill draconian. Also not surprising, I expect, is that organizations uh, concerned with free speech online are against it. The Electronic Frontier Foundation called it a dangerous wish list. The Center for Democracy and Technology uh, said that the House version of the bill would cause, I'm quoting, broad collateral damage to freedom of expression and privacy. New York Times and the LA Times have both editorialized against these bills. The LA Times said they go to dangerous extremes, excuse me, risky extremes. I want to get the quote right. What may be a little more of a surprise, at least to some people, is the range of opposition to these bills. In the Senate, Ron Wyden is against it. So is Rand Paul. In the House, both Nancy Pelosi and Daryl Issa are against it. But in a way, we shouldn't be surprised by that range of opposition because ultimately this is not, the argument here is not about copyright. It's about the internet. It's about the structure, the infrastructure of the, inter of the internet and the nature of the internet as an undertaking, as a freewheeling undertaking. So if you're concerned with free speech online, if you're concerned with encouraging free expression online, then you should be against these bills. So I want you to call Congress, I want you to call your representative, I want you to call Scott Brown, I want you to call John Kerry, and I want you to tell them to help give these bills the quick death that they deserve. And in the meantime, you uh, may want to check out AmericanCensorship.org. That's American Censorship, normal spelling, one word, dot O-R-G, for more information. Oh, and there's a footnote to all this. A little bit ago, the big technical argument was over um, what was called net neutrality. This is the idea that carriers of internet data, which basically means the phone and cable companies, outfits like Verizon and Comcast and so on, cannot discriminate among data. All data must be, tre must be treated equally. The idea is that some, again, some Hollywood conglomerate could not come in and pay them a fee and have their data zip right through while all the other data from ordinary folks has to sit and wait. TechDirt.com has come up with a list of 13 members of the House and 15 senators who opposed net neutrality on the grounds that this was a government intrusion into the operations of the internet, who now support these bills that would give corporations unprecedented control over what you see and hear and read online. Uh, if you want to see that list, email me, I'll send you the link. Oh, I will tell you, nobody from Massachusetts is on that list. So. Or now, something I did want to talk about more, and again, I'm not going to have time for it, but I want to do this in some depth. But I don't have time, so I'm going to have to do it quickly. I wanted to talk about Egypt. I want to talk about the elections and about the demonstrations in Tahrir Square leading up to them. I also wanted to talk about Syria, about the uh, continued efforts of the Assad regime to hold on to power in the face of months of ongoing demonstrations that they have not been able to put down despite having killed over a thousand people in these demonstrations. 
Um, the Arab Spring is becoming the Arab Summer, becoming the Arab Fall. Now it's heading into the Arab Winter. I also wanted to talk about the surprising and significant actions by the Arab League to diplomatically and economically isolate Syria. But actually, I, I won't have time to go into that in any depth, but I did want to say this about Egypt. I was delighted, I was moved to see the, uh, the elections, um, to see the enthusiasm of people able to register their opinion for the first time ever. There were some screw-ups in the election, but it's the first national election in a country of 80 million people. It, the problems were no more than you would have expected. The thing is, people here are aware, at least some of them are aware of the protests in Tahrir Square, recently, and, but they don't seem to know what drove those protests, and that's what I wanted to tell you about. Now, first, you've got to know that the state of emergency in Egypt, which was, which was put in place 30 years ago, is still in effect. That state of emergency effectively makes the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, um, the army, the de facto dictators of Egypt. What prompted the protest was the Supreme Council's proposed constitutional guidelines, guidelines for the Constitution to be drafted. Their guidelines would keep the military budget secret. It would allow the military to appoint 80% of the people to sit on the commission to draft the Constitution. It would allow the military to veto any, any articles of that Constitution that it wanted to before it ever went to a national referendum, and it would declare the military the guardian of the Constitution. In other words, military domination of the entire process and lack of any clear guarantee of an actual civilian government. That's what sparked the protest. Because even as people vote, uh, the problem is, in the words of the noted Middle East correspondent Robert Fisk, I'm quoting, it's going to produce a parliament that cannot appoint ministers, that cannot appoint a government, and whose constitution, whatever it turns out to be, is going to be guided by the army. I said this about Libya, it is also true of Egypt. The battle does not end with the end of the battle. There are still struggles ahead. The U.S. has enormous leverage in Egypt. The U.S. gives the Egyptian military $1.3 billion in military aid every year. The United States should go to that army and say, here's your choice, back off or lose out. Uh, okay, some stuff about Occupy. Can't let a week go by without mentioning Occupy. Occupy Philadelphia has been kicked out. Occupy Los Angeles has been forcibly kicked out. All the talk, all the claims of the government on both, uh, of both cities, all the talk about how much they understood the protest, how much they agreed with the message of the protest, all the talk about wanting to work together, oh, to work it out, to find ways for the encampments to be allowed to continue, it was all lies. Or, all right, let me, be, let me be fair to them. Maybe it wasn't lies. Maybe it was just wishful thinking in the expectation that the protests were just going to dissolve after a little while and go away on their own so everything could go back to normal. And when the protests didn't dissolve on their own, well, then it was time for the empire to strike back. Occupy Boston had the right idea. They actually got a, a, an injunction. They got an injunction against being removed by the city. Um, so the city can't evict them without another court hearing. Now, that hearing will have taken place by the time you see this. It's uh, December 1st is when that hearing, uh, though it's very unlikely a decision will have been made, but the hearing will have taken place on December 1st. Um, the city is seeking to have the injunction lifted. Um, because, as you know, it's deja vu all over again, another big city mayor who claimed to be a big supporter of the Occupy movement now wants to go away, citing, yet again, public health and safety. But in the meantime, the Boston Police Department has some tricks of its own. They recently blocked people from bringing winterized tents into the, the encampment. They called them contraband and they also blocked any insulation for the existing tents to be brought in on the grounds that they were building materials. So apparently the idea here is, well, if it turns out we can't kick them out, we can freeze them out. All these things are taking place against the backdrop of a new Commerce Department uh, a report. It said employee pay is now down to its smallest portion of the total economy since government started keeping these records in 1929. 
Corporate profits are the biggest section of the economy that they've been since 1929. The richest 1% of the country are getting over 20% of the national income, the highest since, again, the 1920s. Now, I've seen various statements from various op-eds in various governments in various cities in various places saying about how it's time for the Occupy movement to, if you will, fold its tents and get involved in real political action. And real pol political action, too, they all seem to say this, make the changes we need to make. So what they're saying to the Occupy movement is stop doing what you're doing. Start using all the methods that have been used all along. Yep. Uh, start using the familiar methods, the ones we're comfortable with, the ones that serious people have been using all of these past few decades. Stick with the methods that serious people have been using even as inequality has grown, even as the biggest banks have gotten bigger. Stick with the methods that have been used even as employee pay has shrunk to its smallest part of the economy in 80 years. The methods have been used even as corporate profits have become their biggest part of the economy in over 80 years. Uh, Continue using the same methods that we're comfortable with, that we're familiar with, that we know how to deal with, even as the top 1% gets the biggest share of national income that it's gotten in 80 years. Forget this encampment business, they're told. Stick to the methods that have been used as decades of economic progress get undone. Stick to those methods. That's what they're being told. Well, I said before that the strength of the Occupy movement was that it was something the empire could not dismiss. It wasn't a one-day event. Uh, it was an ongoing, in-your-face presence that the empire did not know how to, how to ignore, which is why the desire on one hand to break it and on the other to channel the efforts into those same narrow alleys that for the vast majority of us always seem only to lead down. Now, there are other encampments, even, even if those fade away, or get beaten down, um, some other creative form of protest will arise. And, and I think the co-option so desired by the empire will not occur. In fact, Occupy Oakland, for example, um, has been staging flash mob protests inside stores and banks, which is something it seems to me I suggested several weeks ago. Because as I said before, the tactical issue here is not the encampments. The tactical issue is the visibility. The important thing is being visible. Again, it doesn't have to be 24-7. It doesn't have to be long-term. I've mentioned this before. I'll mention it again. For example, New Brunswick, New Jersey, uh, their Occupy is three hours a day. Just they're doing every three hours a day, every day they do something. There's a man in, what's the town? La Veta, Colorado. It's in southern Colorado. And he's camping out all by himself just for a few days. So I've said it before. Say it again. I want to see. Occupy everywhere. I want to see an Occupy Carver. I want to see an Occupy Plymouth. Um, and if you're interested in that, you think you could get behind that, even if it's just not permanent, even if it's not 24 7, even if it's just a couple of hours, just to show our solidarity with those people struggling for economic justice, you email me, whoviating at aol.com. We'll talk about this. But for now, I'm out of time. I got to get out of here. Um, so I'm going to say to you again, remember, whoviating at aol.com. Uh, and you have the best week you possibly can, and we will see you next week.